We are in a battle for the soul of America. This is a fraud on the American public. Welcome to After America from the Australia Institute. I'm Dr. Emma Shortis. I'm Director of International and Security Affairs. Earlier this month, the Australia Institute had the privilege of hosting His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, the President of Timor-Leste, as part of our 30th anniversary celebrations. President Ramos Horta is a Nobel Peace Laureate who has dedicated his life to fighting for Timorese freedom from oppression. In early October, President Ramos Horta spoke at the Sydney Opera House and the National Press Club in Canberra, and we were also lucky enough to have him join us on the podcast as well. President Ramos Horta and I spoke about safeguarding democracy, about independence and peace building in our region. We spoke too about Palestine, the implications of ongoing conflict in the Middle East and the importance of the equal application of international law. President Ramos Horta spoke about the role of the United Nations and particularly the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, which is usually referred to as UNRWA. UNRWA plays a critical role in Palestine, delivering and distributing aid. In the aftermath of the October 7 attacks and following an investigation that lasted 10 months, the head of UNRWA, Philippe Lazzarini, announced that nine people had been dismissed from the agency because, and I quote, the evidence, if authenticated and corroborated, could indicate that the UNRWA staff members may have been involved in the attacks of 7 October. Since then, UNRWA's role in Palestine has come under sustained attack. After we recorded this conversation with President Ramos Horta, the Israeli government passed laws that ban UNRWA from operating in Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu accused UNRWA workers of being involved in, quote, terrorist activities. UNRWA Commissioner General Lazzarini has said that this ban puts an entire generation of children at risk. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said that the ban could have devastating consequences for Palestinian refugees in the occupied Palestinian territory, which is unacceptable. Guterres went on to say that, I call on Israel to act consistently with its obligations under the Charter of the United Nations and its other obligations under international law, including under international humanitarian law and those concerning privileges and immunities of the United Nations. National legislation cannot alter those obligations. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates that 42,000 Palestinians have been killed by Israel's actions in Palestine. More than 14,000 of those are children. 1.9 million people have been displaced. Half of those are children. As we've discussed before on this show, what is being allowed to happen in Gaza has global implications including for American democracy. And that's why we think this conversation with His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta is so timely. Here he is now. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. A great pleasure. Thank you for inviting me to Australia for the 30th anniversary. It's our our absolute pleasure to have you here. Now, I wanted to jump straight in because you've just come from the National Press Club of Australia uh, where you spoke to Australian journalists. And somewhat unsurprisingly, the first question that you got from an Australian journalist was about the role of China in our region and great power competition between China and the United States. You and Timor Leste pride yourself on independence and the moral and values led role that you play in international relations. So I wanted to ask you about how Timor Leste navigates that great power competition between China and the United States. Our uh, relationship with the uh, United States, with Australia, with China, Japan, South Korea, India, and other uh, small, mid sized, uh, major powers, is so natural uh, that uh, we don't. Uh, sit around and uh, agonize over uh, anything, (laughs) Uh, we probably have a more affinity with Australia and uh, China because we, Timor Leste, are very active, dynamic, multi-party democracy with absolutely freest media, 
very competitive democracy, very competitive politics. So uh, we have a more political affinity with uh, the so-called Western democracies. Uh, I say so-called because, uh, well, there are democracies in Africa, democracies in uh, Latin America, in Asia. So uh, uh, what I mean is that we uh, have a, a lot of affinity with all other democracies, wherever they may be. But uh, Australia, like New Zealand, like other countries, have a different um, and us, different approach to uh, relationship with China, and that's again normal. And it doesn't have to be uh, an issue that has to be feared by uh, anyone. We know who, what China is, uh, one party system, they are not uh, a multi party democracy. It is not uh, like you have a, a absolutely uh, active freedom of expression, freedom of opinion in China. They don't give you that much space, but that doesn't bother us. Uh, so I, uh, we are not judgmental about to China. China is a major uh, civilization, 5,000 years at least of which 2,000 as an independent entity. So it's a long, long ancient uh, country. And um, they always uh, look at things in the long-term perspective. For them, uh, something that happened 500 years ago, that means it was recent. You know, uh, when someone asked the then premier of China, uh, Zhu Enlai, to comment on the French Revolution, he said, oh, that is too soon. <laughs> and uh, so uh, for Australia, a new country, yes, yeah, something that happened last year is already that was a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, and again, so for us, we have zero concern about China. We have a lot of curiosity and a lot of uh, respect uh, for the Chinese. A, as a people, those people, they suffer also a lot through their history. They suffer from poverty. They suffer from internal upheavals over generation, civil war. They suffer from Western invasion, aggression. Uh, so many Western countries invaded China and abused the Chinese, humiliated the Chinese. And they have a memory of all of this. So they want to be a superpower. They work hard to be a superpower, uh, partly for their own sake as a country, to feed their people, educate their people, and to compete. But another is so that no one ever will invade them again with impunity. Do you, I mean, you, you mentioned Western aggression there and long memories in China. Are you worried, though, about the immediate short term of relations between China and the United States, particularly because the, the language coming out of the United States around China is increasingly belligerent, I think, especially in yeah. light of the U.S. election. Very much so. And uh, in the past, yes, election time, during the Cold War election time, hysteria about, about the Soviet Union. And uh, now hysteria about China. In the 80s, hysteria in the U.S. about Japan, even though Japan is uh, very small compared to United States or compared to China. Japan is an ally of the United States. But in the 80s, there, it was a, a Japanese bashing, Japan bashing in the US. Why? Because some economies were predicting, forecasting that Japan was going to overtake the US as number one economy. And when the Japanese bought Rockefeller Center, 
the Americans went berserk, went hysterical. I can understand the French going uh, berserk if you buy Notre Dame. If the Japanese had bought Notre Dame, <laughs> you buy Rockefeller's and it's like buying uh, Bloomingdale's or buying big deal. <laughs> but uh, Americans don't have any major uh, historical institution. So for them, Rockefeller Center is like the Basilica, St. Peter Basilica. <laughs> so they went crazy. <laughs> But then, then after all, they didn't beat they didn't beat America economically, because I, I'm saying you know, difficult for anyone to overtake the U.S. They have all the resources of this world right there. They don't need to go anywhere. Huge continent. To the north they have a Canada. To the south they have a Latin America, and most of them and is a. Uh, relatively friendly to the United States, or they have complete dominance there. Then to the east and west, they have the two great oceans, totally open, Atlantic and the Pacific. And uh, that uh, connect them with the rest of the world, but also protect them from any enemies. So, uh, and the U.S. always more innovative more inventive, more creative. Unlike even the Europeans or the Chinese, the Americans have this incredible strength of innovation, of discovery, of uh, invent uh, research, and uh, and they will remain like that. Any time in the near future, in the future, an American president will come with uh, some trillion dollar strategy to invest in universities, in new infrastructures in the U.S., and uh, it will be a, 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 an economic economic uh, miracle again, another miracle uh, happening in the U.S. They have unlimited resources. There is no way, no plausible scenario for the U.S. to fear China. Mm -hmm. Which is a very refreshing view that we don't hear very, very often, um, as is your optimism, I think, about the United States. But the United States does at the moment seem to be stuck when it comes to its international leadership role, particularly moral leadership on conflict prevention and, and conflict resolution, particularly in Gaza and Ukraine. You have been particularly strong in your stance on Gaza and in Ukraine and on moral leadership and, and international law. Do you have hope for the role of the United States and the United Nations in resolving those conflicts? Well, uh, I'm so disillusioned, so disappointed with the West a West that preach about democracy, rule of law, rules-based order, with a lot of skepticism about this rules-based order that was coined by the West. Uh, and when I see these uh, uh, double standards, uh, where, for instance, one, one example, huh? When uh, allegations surfaced a few months, few weeks after uh, Hamas attack Israeli citizens, murder Israeli citizens, uh, Israel alleged that seven elements serving with the United Nations Relief Agency in Gaza were in fact operatives of Hamas. They operated from the UN compound facilities. Uh, they took part in uh, attacking uh, uh, Israeli civilians. There was never any evidence of that till today. There is no such evidence. And yet, Australia, almost all other countries, with the exception of Norway at that time, uh, Impose immediate sanctions 
own the UN, made punitive collective uh, punishment of all Palestinians. So they imposed sanctions on this UN agency. Only Norway said, no, we are not going to do that. And yet, in the uh, mountains of evidence, visual and documented evidence of carpet bombing of the entire Gaza territory, of uh, extreme rightists in Israel ransacking, killing people in the West Bank, in uh, orchestrating attacks on uh, Iranian uh, leaders in Syria, then uh, Lebanon. There is, and with evidence from uh, ICC, the International Criminal Court Prosecutor, Mr. Khan, with evidence from the ICJ, International Court of Justice, uh, classifying, defining as a war crime, genocide, what's happening in Gaza, there is still no sanctions whatsoever, quite the contrary. You hear platitudes from Australia and others, always trying to justify the Israelis. So what does that mean? Australia and other countries, they lose the greatest strength that each of us can have. And that is our moral strength. We are not saying Australia should um, invade Israel or Im impose a comprehensive economic trade boycott of Israel. But God, don't make excuses, don't explain away very unconvincingly. Uh, that all, what Israel is doing is what it is entitled to do, and that is self-defense. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, Israel occupied illegally Palestinian territory for 75 years. Uh, then Israel, uh, Palestinians, tired of it, no solution in sight, betrayed for 75 years. They take matters in their own hands, and they are called terrorists. So all of these uh, debates uh, the West, weaken the West. So next time, when Europeans uh, and others come to us to ask for support on some initiative from the United States or from uh, uh, Africa or Latin America or Asia, well, don't be surprised if they say, no, we are not going to support you. Uh, because there is no credibility. Uh, they don't realize this, that uh, what they are doing, Australia is doing, uh, the West is doing, weaken the West. And uh, you lose moral authority, then what do you have? You end up only with the weapons you have trying to sell the weapon. But the weapons, we will, you already know, it's not going to win to win you anything. It will, it will only kill more, make people more angry. And more people will fight back, more people will take revenge. Mm. And, the, and the cycle will continue. And I think, you know, what we've, learnt having you here, having the privilege of, of having you here is that Timor-Leste has an extraordinary story of reconciliation and, and conflict resolution that we could all learn a lot from and, and from that moral clarity. So thank you so much, Your thank Excellency, you. for your time. Pleasure and honour. My conversation with Jose Ramos Horta was recorded on the 9th of October and as we know all too well, a bunch of stuff has happened since then. If you're enjoying After America, please help us spread the word by telling your friends about the show. You can find us on social media. We're at the Oz Institute, that's with an AUS, on Twitter and Instagram. And you can reach out to us with feedback and episode ideas via our email address, which is podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au. And if you want to hear more from us, you can subscribe for regular updates via the link in our show notes. Our music is from Blue Dot Sessions. 
I'm Emma Shortis. Thanks for listening. Thank you.